God be blessed and all of his people. And everybody said, amen. And I want to say once again, always glad to see you. Thank you for your presence. All of the things you do to promote the combined Sunday school class. I praise you for the comments, the reviews, and any other role that you may play in causing this program to prosper. Thank Pastor Turner, each and every one of you. Love all of you. And I want to challenge you today. We got a very, very challenging lesson on today. This challenge is everybody, and you should find yourself in this lesson somewhere. Amen. And be mindful. Amen. We normally teach this lesson in the New Testament, but our author has allowed us to teach it in the Old Testament today. And it's all about being obedient. And I, and I want you to see how this entire lesson, and even though we got several chapters, uh, what the author did is begin in chapter 19 and went to the closing, which is chapter 24. And those chapters all deal with the covenant and the Passover, social responsibilities, the Ten Commandments, and anything of covenant nature. Amen. And so that's what we're going to look at. So we're going to look at it as one continuous lesson from chapter 19 to chapter 24. And you'll see uh, it, it's done in our lesson text. So just stay with me. Hope you enjoy. God bless you. Love all of you. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. You are good and your mercy endureth forever. And one thing that you require of all of us is obedience. And help us, Lord, to understand how important obedience is to you. Amen. In our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, here we are here, and this promise is promise of obedience because of all of the good things that God has done for us. Amen. So let's just look at this. We started in Exodus chapter 1, and we look at a setting here first. And let's look at that in chapter 1. In the third month. Now, understand, this is the third month. The third month is not over. Amen. They've left, they've left Egypt here. This is the beginning of the third month. So they've only left uh, Israel or been delivered from Israel less than three months. Amen. More closer to two months. That's their travel time. Okay, but, the, but the, if you read, read the first verse, it sounds like three months, but it's more closer to two months than three months. But look at it. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth, that means when they were delivered from slavery. God had did the ten plagues and everything. Pharaoh had let them go. Pharaoh had chased them. And the Lord had miraculously opened up the Red Sea, and they crossed over on dry land. Been less than about two months now since that happened, okay? Understand that now. And then it says, God delivered them, amen, and they were gone forth out of the land of Egypt the same day. So the same day that they left Egypt, two months later, on the same identical day, they arrived in Mount Sinai. Amen. And if you'll note, a few lessons ago, Moses and God. God had commissioned him to lead the children of Israel, go to Pharaoh, and petition that they let him go. Moses objected. Hello, God gave him two, two promises. One, I'll be with you. And the other one was more of a physical promise to let him know, hey, that wasn't no dream. That was real. 
I told you you return to this mountain and worship me on this mountain. Now, now that's about to be fulfilled. And, and it's ironic that that's in the first chapter, uh, in this chapter, in the first verse, because it reminds Moses that God is faithful to his promises. Amen? And understand this. This lesson tells you that. God never broke his promises to Israel. But Israel always did what? Broke his promises to God. Now, that should be a hint of the challenge that this lesson is going to present to us. Are you being like Israel and breaking your promises of obedience? Or are you being faithful, amen, to God? Amen? Now, chapter 1, we move on. They've been delivered. Chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 2, they're uh, in uh, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. They're the same thing, the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. And it's also called Jabal Musa. Amen. That's another uh, companion term, meaning the same thing as Sinai, Mount Horeb, Amen, and the mountain of God. Jebel Musa, amen. They call that mountain. So as Bible students, you should know that, amen. So that's why I mention it. Now, for they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before them. Now, now, understand this, they've returned. God has kept his promise to Moses. Everything that he wanted to do, uh, everything that God wanted to do, amen, he has done it, he's delivered them. It's been roughly about two months, and God now begins to give Moses an assignment. We look at the setting in verse 1. And verse 2. Now we come to the covenant. Now understand, there are some things that God wants to control. And one, the covenant was designed by God and given by God, and it touches on three areas of their life. Amen. Now, God gave the commandments that was included in the covenant. God gave the commandments to help control and or govern their personal lives. Okay? Their personal lives. That's one. He also gave the law. Amen? Now, the law was given to help them control their social life how they interacted and dealt one with another, their social behavior. Amen. God wanted to govern that, and he was doing it with the law. Now, God also wanted to govern their religious lives. Amen. That's why he gave the ordinances, and the ordinances to control their religious lives, how they approached and or worship God. Amen. They couldn't just approach God any way they wanted to. They couldn't just worship him any way they decided to do it. You have to worship God and approach God on his terms, not your terms. Amen. So now remember those three areas because the application is for us today. God wants to govern your personal lives. Amen? He wants to govern your social lives, how you deal, interact one with another, and your religious lives, how you interact and worship with him. That's what the law was designed for. Now, the law was not designed for your salvation. 
the law was given as a schoolmaster to teach them that they could not make a proper relationship with God trying to keep the law. And God wanted them to receive the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ hadn't come on the scene just yet. But nevertheless, God gave the law, which we call a covenant, to get them to be willing to accept the shedded blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why God gave the law. Okay. All right. We want to clear the air on that. The, air, the law was given to identify sin. And in the end, there were 613 laws, not even counting the ones that rabbis added on to it. If you broke one, you broke them what? You broke them all. There's no one that ever kept the law perfectly but one. And we know who that is, Jesus Christ himself. And when he kept it perfectly, he gave it. We got credit for it. Amen. Amen. Understand that. So as we give the covenant, keep those things in mind. As students of the Bible, you should know that. Now, now he goes to the assignment. They've been freed down from slavery roughly about 60 days, 60 plus days, and so forth. And so now God is trying to govern these three specific areas in their lives with the law. And Moses went up unto God. Now the good thing about it and the application for you and me today, make sure, I don't care how religious you are, Moses was one of the ones that could wish of God near. God let him come near to him. The, 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 the 70 elders and all of the rest of them and the leaders of the clan, 70 of them went up the mountain. That's in chapter 4, verse 1, 2, and 3. They couldn't come near to God. And the ordinary people couldn't even come up the mountain. They had to stay down at the bottom. Moses was what? Near to God. And guess what? He could not even come in his presence without God's permission. Amen. Now, understand this. We all, even if you're Moses, you need some quiet time with God. Sometimes. And I'm not just talking about coming to church. Coming to church is good, and the Bible advocates that. Thou shalt not forsake the sinning of ourselves together as it is a manner of some. Hebrews 10, 25, come to church. That's what that means. Don't be like other folk that don't come to church. You, you need to do that, but you also need to spend some quality time. Just you and God. Hello. Praying. Seeking God's face. Amen. Moses went looking for God. Hello. He, he might have had an appointment. God might have told him to come, but, but, but here in the text, is, Moses is looking for God. Hello, and God cries out. And, of course, he had an assignment. Look at it. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain. So, thus shall thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. Now look at this. He got the house of Jacob and the children of Israel. Now, now both of them mean the same thing. They are, they are, they are companion terms. But if you exegete the house of Jacob is the Jacob is the leader of the 12 clans. He had 12 children, and each one of his 12 children were the name of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, when they left and went to Egypt, because there was a famine in the land, there were only 69 people, and Joseph himself made 70. God was reminding them where they come from. You started off and it was only 70 of you. That's why he called them the house of Jacob. Because when Jacob went to Israel, the famine had about, they about starved to death. 
Joseph had went on ahead. God had him in place to take care of them when they got there. They were a small group of people, 70 people. Now, the name children of Israel, they had done catapulted into a nation then over 5,000, excuse me, 5 million strong. Hello. You know what God was doing? He was reminding them where they come from. See, because sometimes the reason we're obedient, we forget where we come from. Hello. Talk to me if you can. Amen. I'm trying to win friends and influence people. Hello. But it's kind of hard to do it in these two verses. And God is doing the talking. Hello. First thing he does, he says, I want you to go tell the people, and I want them to remember how they got started and who it was that's been taking care of them all these years. Hello. Hello. That's in the next verse. Come on. Come on. You might as well go with me. He done went up. He's the spokesman now. He's the prophet for the children of Israel. God told him to do the talking, and God is doing the what? Giving him the words to say. Look at it. It says, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Now, don't, they, 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 they were probably going to try to claim amnesia, but it's only been roughly about 60 days ago. They knew what happened to the Egyptians that God opened up the Red Sea and, and they went across on dry land, but all the Egyptians understand, all, and their armies and their chariots and, and the king, the pharaoh, all of them drowned it in the Red Sea. And the first thing God does, he reminds them what he has done for them. He, he, he doesn't try to tell them what I'm going to do uh, uh, in the future or uh, uh, what's going on now. He says, all this is is just what I already did for you. Hello. Hello. I, I know God had did something for you. Bible says, from your mother's womb, Hello. God knitted you and wove you together in your mother's womb before your mama and your daddy even knew that there was a uh, um, birth going to take place because of their action, a contraception. Before they even knew it, your mama and your daddy, hello, God's personal touch was already on you in your mother's womb. And it didn't stop there. The Bible says, and God took out the book, the book of life, and wrote your name down in the Lamb's book of life. He already knew your name before you were ever born, when you were just a thought between your mother and your father, God already knew you. That's what he's talking about. Hello. He took care of it. Look, look how he says it right here. He just says here, he says, he says, you remember what I did to the Egyptian. He's calling on him to be a witness. See, when you're a witness to something, when you see it firsthand yourself, you don't forget it too quickly. Hello. So they knew what God was talking about. Then what else did he tell them? He said, and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now, now, now this is a metaphor. It takes things that are unsimilar and unalike and compares them where they seem to be a likeness or a message behind it. And if you know anything about eagles, when they're learning how to fly, 
See, when they leave the nest, the mama eagle put the baby eagles on her back, and she takes to the air. And when the, when the baby eagle gets his nerves up and he thinks he's got it, he, he makes a couple of flaps and the mama just drops out and let him fly on his own. Sometimes when they realize he's flying, he gets scared and all nervous and mess up and down, and mama just goes into a dive, gets right up on him, catches him on a wing, and just soars on off, taking care of him. Hello. And God was trying to let them know, I've been taking care of you, just like a mother eagle takes care of her own. Amen. God has said, I have been the one nurturing you, protecting you, taking care of you. And based on that fact alone, you ought to be grateful enough to enter in to a relationship with me based upon what I already done for you. Hello, somebody. Amen. Amen. And even if you don't think that's noteworthy of a relationship, God is expecting. He's expecting you to enter a relationship with him. Look at, look at what happens. Look at what happens. And, and while we're here, I want to tell you this. This passage, chapter 19, verses 1 through uh, 6, is also known as the eagle's wing speech. Amen. Amen. The eagle's wing speech. Because God was comparing himself. And, and, and like I say, a metaphor, take two things that are not identical, God and eagles, that, that don't seem uh, no similarities. But when you look at them and exegete them, hello, God is the eagle. And the eagle takes care of his babies, and God takes care of his children, and we see a likeness in that. That's why I told you it was a metaphor. Amen. So here, here it is. And God says, I'm the one that's been taken. Now, now look what he does in chapter 5. We know what that word therefore means, don't we? Therefore draw the conclusion based upon the previous stated information. Hello. He said, now, now that I reminded you how good I've been to you and what I already did for you, now he comes up with the covenant. If you will obey my voice indeed and do what? Keep my what? Covenant. Hello. God was expecting them to enter in a covenant relationship with him based on what he already did for them. Hello, somebody. He said, if you do that, then. Now, now, let's stop right there. If we go back, now, if. This is what you call an if-then clause. That means that the covenant is conditional. Hello. God said, if you do that, then what? I will do my part. I will keep my promise. If you keep your promise, hello, and enter into a relationship with me. Now, this covenant is called the Mosaic Covenant. It didn't do away with the, Mo uh, the Abrahamic Covenant. It's laid right alongside the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham covenant didn't go away. All the nations of the world be blessed through Abraham's seed. That was the Abrahamic covenant. Now we lay the Mosaic covenant right beside it. They all go right together. Hello? You need to understand that as Bible student. Amen. And then he says, and keep my covenant, even though it's just a the Abrahamic covenant was unconditional. They didn't have to do anything to earn that. This one 
they had to do their part and God had to do his part. And God said, then you shall be what? A special, a treasure, a precious treasure unto me above all the people in the world. And God said, I could choose from anybody I want to. The whole earth belongs to me. I, I didn't have to choose you, but I did. And I want you to stop right there. Of all the millions and billions of people in the world, God didn't have to choose you. He didn't have to choose me. He could have chose anybody that he wanted to choose. Hello. But he chose you. Hello. That's what he already have done for you. That's why he's expecting you to enter into a relationship with him. But it moves on. It moves on. It says, God, uh, you'll be a treasure above all people. Look, look at the special place God had in mind for them. Hello. And, and, and that's in the next verse, too. But God had already made plans for them and put them in one of the highest positions. Hello. To him. He chose them. Amen. He didn't have to do that. He chose me and you. He didn't have to do it. But he did it anyway. That's why he's expecting you to enter into relationship with him. Hello. Hello. Here it is. Right in black and white. I didn't make it up. But it goes on, and, and now comes the challenge. We looked at the setting. We looked at the assignment. And now we looked at the challenge. And ye shall be a kingdom of priests. Now, Moses was a prophet and a priest, and Aaron was a priest. And Aaron taught the people and, and nurtured the people Learn, taught, and teach, teach, taught the, te the, the people, and that's what priests do, amen. And God wanted to use them to teach other people all about him. That would be their position as a, pri uh, as a priest, lead others to worship the one and true God. That was the position God had already chosen and had in mind for them. That's why he called them a, 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 a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Amen. That's why he called them. He already knew what he wanted them to do, to nurture and bring other people into the fold and help them to worship and know him and teach them as God was taught them. Amen. That's what he wanted them to do. Amen. Amen. And that's what God wants you and me to do today. Are you hoarding God's blessing? Or are you doing what? Going out in the kingdom and being a witness for the Lord. That's what you call it in the New Testament. Being a witness for the Lord. Amen. That's what God wanted them to do. They didn't do it. Amen? But where are you? Are you being obedient? Are you being a good witness for the Lord? Are you trying to live out that role as a priest, helping others to worship God Almighty? God don't have to call you uh, to be a preacher to be a witness. Anybody, anybody can be a witness. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be an evangelist. All you do is just tell your story. And guess what? Everybody Got a story. And that's why God called on them. Because you got a story and I got a story. And if you look back over your life and look back over your story, there's not one of you to say, can say that God did not bless me and did not bring me in on eagle's wings. Because I know he did. Because you didn't always get it right. Hello. Amen. 
and he was patient and loving and forgiving towards you. That's what he's talking about here to the Israelites. Amen. But he moves on. He moves on. He moves on here in verse 20. We will jump to chapter 24 now, which is the, which is the end of it. Uh, so we left a few chapters, but uh, look at the end. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all of the judgment. That's the Ten Commandments, the ordinance, ordinances, as well as the law. He told the people everything God said. And he also had the tablets of stone. Now, he already had them now. That was in 19 when he started off. He didn't have them. But now, he didn't already had them. Okay, now the judgment. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. They promised obedience. Hello. Now, they did everything except what? Except be obedient. Amen. Amen. That's a picture of you and me. We promise. Every one of us walked down the aisle and gave our life to Christ and promised that we'll be obedient to him. And one by one, we messed up. And if we fast forward, fast forward all the way to the end right here, it, it, it would tell you that there was a price that had to be paid. When they went into the promised land, all of them didn't go. Those that were 20 years old and over, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until every one of them died. It's a sad commentary. Sad commentary. Why? Because they let sin and disobedience ruin their life. Only those people that went into the promised land were 20 years old and younger. And Joshua and Caleb. And the thing that I want you to get un to understand is you're on that path somewhere. I don't know where. But you can just let sin control your life until you just wander around for years on top of years until you die. Amen. And not make it to the promised land. Sin and disobedience will get you there. And if you don't believe it, read the history. I'm telling you the God truth. I'm telling you what God loves. I'm telling you the truth. And the application for me and you today is where are you at? Are you wandering around being disobedient? Or are you like those 20 years and younger? that don't have that mentality of sin and disobedience and on your way into the promised land, which is heaven. Now, this is a tough lesson for anybody. I, I don't care who you are. <laughs> I don't care if you're a preacher, you're a teacher, you're an evangelist, where you at on the road. Hello. It's going to pan out the same way that the Israelites did. Not gonna change. Some gonna make it in and, and some not. But God already laid it out in black and white. And this was right from the beginning. He haven't changed any. God is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Hello. And this lesson was meant to be a challenge. And I told you it was gonna challenge you. I don't care who you are. Challenging anybody. Hello, where are you at? Now, I want to bring that to the forefront just because we're in the middle of the lesson and I want you to think about what this lesson is really about. Amen. Being 
obedient to God. You make the choice. God has a beautiful plan for your life if you only let him. Hello. Okay, verse 4. Uh, and Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning. They done ratified the contract now. That's what they did. When they said whatever the Lord said, that, that was the ratification of the contract. Amen. Moses got up, he built the altar, put up 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Israel, and now he's saying here, this is what? Altars and stuff stood for a reminder. We, we, we have things now we call visual aids. Amen. This was a visual reminder when they seen the altar and they seen the 12 stones that he had put up. To remind them, you don't automatically ratify the contract and the covenant with God. Amen. And sometimes we need things to remind us so we don't get amnesia and forget the promises that we made to God. Amen? Now, now, verse 5, and he sent young men, children of Israel, offered burnt offerings, uh, sacrificed peace. Now, he took the, the, the young men because the, the priesthood had not been implemented yet. Okay? So he just used the young men, and they did two types of offerings. The burnt offering. What was uh, the primary thing that happened with a burnt offering? It was what? Burnt what? Completely. Nothing left. Nothing. nothing. Now that's a metaphor too. But what does it mean? It means total dedication. That's what they have promised God. Total dedication. When the, when, the, when, the, when the burnt offering was burnt up complete, nothing left. That means total dedication. Now, what did the peace offering? The peace offering mean uh, proper relationship, uh, spiritual relationship. And usually when they had an occasion like this, they usually cook a meal as well. And that's what they did with the peace offering. They cooked the meal. It was eaten by the worshipers. And they had peace one with another, and that was the covenant-making meal that was included, okay? Now, we got that, now we got verse 6, and Moses took half the blood. Remember this right now. The blood represented the sacrifice that would come. Wasn't there yet, just the animal's blood now. But whose blood would eventually be shed? That looked forward to Calvary. Amen. And the blood that will be shed once and for all. Now, what they were doing with it here and now, it will have to be done what? Continuously. Always killing lambs and goats and bulls because the covering was what? Only temporary. Amen. It lasted. But then the next year, they had to go right through the sacrificial system again. Understand that. Now, and then verse 7, and uh, excuse me, and Moses took half the blood and put it in the basin and half the blood, sprinkled it on the altar. That was a confirmation that the covenant was ratified. Hello. Amen. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Verse 7, and he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to the audience of the people, and they said what? All that the Lord has said, will we do and be obedient. Now, when he read that aloud, they knew exactly what their responsibilities were, and they knew what they were agreeing to. Hello. It wasn't that they didn't know. They knew. <laughs> they had the Suzerain Treaty that they were familiar with. And it was similar to the uh, covenant that God made. And always remember that. Some people say God made a suzerain uh, covenant. No, he didn't. The suzerain completely different. Well, not a lot, but 
That was when a strong king would tell a weak king, you know, we're going to rule over you. You either give us this and that and pay us tribute, or we're going to come ahead and slaughter all of your people. And so the people, they go into slavery and give them so much preview, um, tribute every year. That was a suzerain treaty. And usually that was a powerful king versus a weak king or a weak group of people. That was a suzerain treaty. This was similar. And they were aware of a suzerain uh, treaty, but God was a little bit different. Amen. But they promised obedience. Now, look at verse 8, and this last one, we're out of here. The Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Now, that was a confirmation that they, that they accepted the covenant. That was a confirmation. They ratified it. They knew exactly what it, what it entailed and what it meant, and they knew what they were agreeing to. But now, it also means a couple of things. They knew exactly what their responsibility was. They knew the blood uh, was a covenant. They knew it was serious, and they knew the penalties for breaking it. And the last thing was sprinkling the blood Mark the altar and the people as associated with this covenant sacrifice. Now, I wanted to end the lesson on that. I didn't want to say what we said several verses ago about they did not live up to their part in the agreement. They were disobedient, and they broke the covenant. So that's why I said it beforehand, so I wouldn't have to say it at the end, because I always like to end the lesson on a positive note. Amen. I know this lesson challenged you, and it challenged me. Amen. But every word I told you is true. Amen. God bless you. My time is up. And I thank you for yours. Let us look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. And we thank you, Lord, for taking us on eagle wings, taking care of us, Lord, all the days of our lives. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.